Thank you. Awesome. So happy to be here. This is really cool for me. So thanks a lot. I wanted to start by diving back into when you first went to college and you went to University of North Carolina and you were actually studying speech communications and where you initially thought your career was potentially going to go when you were studying that instead of acting. <laughs> well, I was hoping to get out of college. That's where I was hoping my career would go. Um, when I was in undergraduate, nobody in my family had been in the creative arts, uh, certainly not in any way that was uh, significant and memorable for me. So when I started my liberal arts education, um, I, my first major was as a business major. And um, I can't say that I adjusted particularly well my first semester. Um, so my GPA was pretty low. Um, impressively low. And so uh, I started taking uh, uh, different kinds of electives. And one of the electives that I took, I think it was my second semester of my freshman year, was uh, oral interpretation of prose and poetry with um, Paul Ferguson, who is um, legendary in the speech communications department at Chapel Hill as you know somebody who um, really invites people into that. Uh, it's essentially an academic um, the oral interpretation of prose and poetry. There's no way to make a career out of academia um, in that field. Um, but he draws people in. He's kind of magnetic about it. And what I discovered that semester in taking uh, oral interpretation of prose and poetry is it, it would take me... Um, you know, uh, an, an hour of pulling teeth to get through a chapter of Western Civ, um, but studying a poem to perform uh, the next week or whatever, I could spend three hours, six hours, nine hours, 15 minutes, whatever. It, the, I was so engaged with um, the interpretive art part of it, and I, I, I hadn't yet discovered um, the level of self-consciousness that uh, creates so much fear in performing. I was okay being a class clown. So those two things in conjunction, having a creative agency and not being afraid of humiliating yourself, made me an A student uh, in oral interpretation of prose and poetry. And so subsequently, I was like, well, I better take some more of this shit. And by the end of college, I had taken every class in the um, undergraduate and graduate department of the speech communications department. They referred me to some of the drama department um, classes. So I started taking all of the acting classes in the drama department, and those teachers allowed me to take the major classes in acting. So I had taken, I think, just every performance class there possible, mostly as an effort to engage myself as a student and raise my GPA. And then I discovered as an honor student um, towards... <laughs> What a sham. Um, I discovered towards the end of school that um, I, I really loved this and wanted to pursue it and was getting um, terrific support from some of my mentors, Paul Ferguson and um, Didi Corvinus and uh, Susanna Reinhardt. Those were some of my teachers that I remember right now. Um, that I thought I'll, I'll get my um, master's and uh, teach acting. Um, that seemed like a much more sensible approach to being a part of the creative arts than pursuing a career as an actor. But as soon as I got into, uh, is this too long a story? This is, this is okay. perfect. As soon as you got into NYU, Tish. I don't think I've ever had a monologue this, that went on this long, and I've had some long monologues. Um, as soon as I got into Tish, the first day I realized oh, I want to be a professional actor. I just needed to be around other students that had the same kind of like vigorous approach to wanting to make uh, the best uh, career out of it by uh, um, developing a disciplined craft. Yeah. What were some of the really valuable insights and teachings that came out of that time at NYU that really allowed you to figure out and navigate what your technique and approach was going to be as an actor? Well, the most infuriating was like described over long format by Ron Van Loo, who was the uh, acting chair. Was He was the chair of the program and the primary acting teacher and really the guru, the inspiration behind the entire aesthetic of the program and the philosophy, and which essentially boiled down to uh, learn how to create your own craft. 
um, learn how to develop in you a curiosity and, and an affinity to collect tools from anybody you can that will enable you to be your most authentic self as a performer, and which is an infuriating thing to learn when you're going 80 grand in debt, you know? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I thought we were going to get the clues, man. I thought you were going to give us the tools. Um, it turns out they did insofar as they taught you about voice and speech and movement and uh, text analysis. And you're um, given the opportunity to explore all these different genres, you know, great classic playwrights and um, modern plays and um, uh, small parts, big parts, all of that. But essentially his point is... If you want to have, if you want to like embark on the em enterprise of having a career as an actor, you have to be prepared for your instrument to change over a period of time. You have to be prepared for the marketplace to change over time. And the only way to then maintain it is to keep an openness about your own process. So if you're not uh, finding a way in with a certain approach, um, fi find, go, go where the light is. You know, if you're finding more success on the stage, if you're finding that the thrill of playing great characters is in small parts on TV, go there. You can accommodate, you can adjust. And uh, that level of flexibility, I think, ended up being a great uh, virtue for me and probably the most important thing, as awful as it was to finally discover that's what he was teaching. Um, uh, that that ends up being the, the 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 thing that's paid off the most, and he and he certainly he he's taught a whole generation of uh, phenomenal actors, and um, so uh, yeah, it was worth paying attention to. <laughs> One of the things I think is always really interesting about learning acting at school is that there is the art of being a performer, but there's also an entire business side of being an actor and being a performer. And you were very fortunate to start getting opportunities very soon after you came out of school. So how did you set about navigating, understanding the business side? And was that something that they also taught you in school? They do teach you. There, it, it is uh, a real gift to be in school at NYU um, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is you're in New York. Uh, so you get to bear witness to the experience of working actors all the time. Um, and uh, the other thing is there are graduates um, who are working, who come back to talk to you and you can ask them questions and um, seek out guidance from them and there's a, a tremendous like mentoring that goes on there in addition to that you have this uh, event or we did um back in 1994 i'm sure there's some sort of corollary now but uh, the graduating class from Yale and the graduating class from NYU would um, do showings. So we would get an afternoon where the casting directors and agents um, in, in the city that were interested would come see us do um, our scenes that we had developed as an introduction into the community. That's a huge leg up. Um, and uh, it gives you the opportunity then to potentially get meetings with some of these people where you can start to root out who you feel most comfortable with, who you think is the most trustworthy, and then you look to the other actors around you who you've admired um, that have either come out of school or are working now, and you see who they're with, and then you ask them about those people, and you kind of follow the, uh, the path to what feels most comfortable for you based upon the people that you trusted. And that led me to, um, Karen Friedman and Philip Carlson at the Writers Art Writers Writers and Artists Agency, um, who ha they had Jeffrey Wright and Liev Schreiber and Phil Hoffman and like you know people that I I revered uh, um, and. Uh, from there, they point you to, you know, somebody who can help you do your taxes and, you know, you know, teach you all of the things that are really intimidating for uh, so many uh, actors coming out. And uh, that kind of support, I, I confess, you feel uh, incredibly lucky and fortunate to have. Yeah. yeah. And do you still have moments on set where there's a, you're in a scene or you're performing something and there's a specific teaching or a class that you kind of think back to from, from when you were at Tish and something that the teacher really gave you as a nugget of information at any point? It's, it's become so ingrained in me now that I tend to think of it something as my own invention. But... <laughs> It's obviously all from them. <laughs> all my, like, I didn't invent anything, but um, the, 
uh, the way that I go about um, text analysis, the way that I go about um, calibrating a tone, um, the way that I go about interacting with people on the set, at, um, and the way that I go about trying to render that performance, um, is just an accumulation of the experience and knowledge that I've had from these kinds of um, th this education. And um, one of the things that I think Ron teaches uh, is if, if the more you can do to get out of your own way, um, uh, whatever that is, whether it's self consciousness or a desire to attach to, you know, like what this performance could do for you or like how you look in a certain light or uh, by the way this is my bad side here i should really be over there we can switch you know i mean that's 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 the way you can think of it often you know like and if you're doing that during the scene you're kind of shit i mean you're you're done so one of the things that he teaches you is to is to get out of your own way and um the, the way to do that uh, is to give yourself motivations that are more important than your own self-consciousness. And that typically has to do with the material. So if you've invested in the material, you really care about what the character cares about, you can bring that to the moment and it helps you to get past um, whatever is going to get in your own way. Yeah. And one of the very early things that you got to do creatively was General College, which was student-produced university access TV. And what were some of the th really valuable things that you learned, especially in being in a place where you had so much creative freedom to, to fail as much as you needed or wanted to? Well, one of the things that I learned that at a certain point is I didn't want to carry the camera equipment. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, we carried all of our own equipment and like, you know, set up the lights and all that stuff. And um, I, I, that is the way that it is as a student, you know, in, in general, when you're doing a, um, a piece of theater, you're the ones and you're the ones who are in charge of moving the set equipment and all um, and breaking down the set after your show is closed. Um, actually doing that um, um, program w was it's such a boon for me because it did give me some level of comfort in front of the camera. N not when I would see my performance, that was incredibly uncomfortable because all I had was energy and, you know, and I, um, if you want to see how far I've come, look at some of those early episodes of General College. You'll know that education had a huge part of me being able to navigate a professional career. Um, but the, um, the proximity to the camera um, and uh, the equipment and being able to compartmentalize and focus. Um, and then most importantly, like living with the results and moving on to the next episode. In, um, even when I sucked terribly and thought I was killing it because I had like slightly manufactured one real-ish emotion, um, which felt like a huge triumph on the day. Then you see it, and it looks like Kabuki style, you know, like, um, it, which ends up being really depressing and upsetting. So you have to like turn the page, get back there the next day, try again, and slowly over the course of four years, I got you know a little bit better, um, and uh, I, I was incredibly grateful for that opportunity. And then you amazingly were in Tom Stoppard's Arcadia just a year after you graduated. And how did that set about you figuring out how your approach on stage was going to be and, and what your process was going to be in theater? Well, my approach during Arcadia was don't get fired. Uh, I just kept my mouth shut as much as I could and like, pretended I knew more than I did. The, the, it, it was just a complete lock for me that if I opened my mouth, I was going to get canned because you would be able to source out pretty quickly that I didn't know what I was doing. The, the text was so complicated um, and the uh, pressure of being at Lincoln Center and it was Trevor Nunn who was directing it. And in high school, I used to watch that, the Shakespeare stuff that he did with Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart and Helen Mirren and, you know, um, so he was already a mentor of mine before I really understood that he was in the world, that he was a real person. They were all iconic figures. And um, so to be directed by him in a play by Tom Stoppard was, um, uh, I, I, I like blacked out for the, you know, much of it. And um, the uh, interest, one interesting thing I remembered uh, is after having spent 
and I worked very hard uh, um, on both the dialect uh, and uh, um, and the text. Um, and also, I was really excited and hyped to use my newly trained voice. So I was really loud. I had to learn how to <laughs> calibrate that a bit. Actually, I had an audition with Kathleen Turner one time. They were doing <laughs> indiscretions um, that I, Jude Law ended up doing. And I, I got to audition with her. And I can remember sitting side by side like this in, uh, in the Broadway theater. And I don't remember what the line was. And, but I said it clearly in a way that was um, meant to fill the space. And she just goes, what? <laughs> like I can't hear you? That sounds mortifying. <laughs> and I, I froze, <laughs> broke into a flop sweat. Uh, <laughs> but it did give me some idea that my voice was loud enough. Um, but uh, so for the, for the, the play, wh after all of that work and preparation, um, when the curtain went up on the first preview um, and Jennifer Dundas said her first line, um, Septimus, what does Connell embrace? Um, and you could hear the audience kind of titillate a little bit and like, oh, wait, something's happening. And I'd say, well, Connell embraces the practice of throwing one's arms around a side of beef. And everybody started laughing and I thought, oh, right, I know what I'm doing here. Um, I understand how to do a play. Yeah. This is all fine, you know? And I relaxed, like my whole body just uh, relaxed and accepted the, um, the, that I, I could occupy that space with just as, with as little work experience as I actually had. I had enough experience in, in that um, relationship to the audience that I could at least be there enough to tell the story yeah. that one night. And then following that, you went on to your first feature film credit with Sleepers. And, but what were some of the biggest learning curves walking onto your first professional set or things that you hadn't really anticipated being part of the process at that level? Um, well, Bear, I grew up, I did a film before that called Grind uh, that Chris Kentis directed that was with Adrian Shelley, actually, and uh, Amanda Peet and Paul Schulze, some, you know, wonderful New York actors um, that Chris Kentis directed. Um, and that was my first uh, acting on film. Um, and the um, working with Barry Levinson, uh, and I, had, I had auditioned many times for that um, because I couldn't quite get the, the dial, dialect right. And um, so I kept working on it and I would come back and I probably had three or four callbacks before I, I got it. And then, um, when we were actually making it, um, getting to feel confident as um, um, like, uh, what's the right word? Like I should be there. Uh, um, uh, Ron Eldar was a huge help to me because Ron was my, um, he was my partner in crime in, in the story. So we had all of our stuff together and he, he was an acting nerd like me. So we got to talk about acting and stuff. Well, we're playing these tough guys, you know, carrying guns and stuff. We're busy talking about theater and uh, uh, motivation. And um, so that certainly helped me calm myself in, this, uh, in that space. And, and Barry was very, um, like, um, um, short and controlled with his direction. So it, you didn't have to get too uh, complicated with your analysis with him. He was like r clear, he knew where the camera was gonna go, he knew what space you occupied in it. So if you could just follow that and not contrive too much in it, um, then you were gonna be fine. He had cast you appropriate, appropriately. Yeah. Um, was that your question? Absolutely. Okay. Right. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about voiceover acting because you did a voiceover um, for Princess, Princess Mononoke, which is a Studio Ghibli film, and it's such a different style of performance. So, how did you think about and approach that differently to other work that you'd done previously at the time? I wouldn't have. I would have never known how the challenge um, that uh, that comes with that kind of work, but th that was one of the most rigorous. Yeah. Uh, weeks of work that I think I've ever had. Um, not the least of which because um, Ashitaka uh, was in a constant state of duress 
And when you're man manufacturing that all by yourself in a booth, uh, you know, really small, it, it's exhausting. Um, and I'm used to feeding off people and uh, building the scene together. And so your your voice ends up getting really tired is one of the things that ends up happening. I also revered, um, even though I don't speak Japanese, the performance by the guy who played Ashitaka because it had this kind of regal authority that um, is really hard to come by. Uh, the authenticity of that voice, um, it sounded like a prince who could save the world. And that's not what I sounded like to myself. So trying to find a way to um, to match that level of authenticity and manage the um, the vocal challenge of that. Again, I go back to the technique. I mean, luckily I had things to fall back on in terms of breathing, vocal warm ups, taking breaks, understanding when you're at your limits, um, not trying to uh, peak your voice every time, and you know, knowing that you've got a certain number of days to do. And then having the humility to go back and fix stuff that didn't work, you know, um, um, that, that was helpful because it was an incredibly humbling experience. Um, and uh, also, the, um, it, it's animated, and they call them the flaps. The flaps of the mouth, um, they were calibrated for the Japanese. And they speak in a very different cadence. And they, I kind of like the laconic American cadence. That's how I roll. Well, there is not a single like sentence or flap of Ashitaka that goes like that. I mean, it's all super rapid fire. And so you have to find a way to do that that doesn't sound like a caricature of some other voice. Um, so there was a lot of different challenges that I found so disinteresting that I avoided doing <laughs> an animated movie since then. One of the things that I was reading a lot about in terms of like different films that you've made that sounds really fascinating is your preparation process and a lot of the research that you do. And when you were doing Without Limits, you were training with Olympian runners. Was that something that very early on in your career felt important to do as prep? Was it something that the producers had come up and, and kind of how has that followed you through on other roles in your career? It's a mix of both. I, I, I typically will read something and have some you know, guesstimate of what I need to do to just start the process, you know, it's good. some of them, yeah, you literally have to be lighter or heavier, you know, um, there's some material consequences. Some of them, you have to learn an accent. Uh, some of them has a re really incredible text that you la have to learn how to spe uh, speak and think through in a concise and articulate way, which is for me really just rigorous practice. It's the same as doing any of the, all those dozens of stupid um, speech warm-ups that I still do before every play um, I do that really help in uh, creating the physical dexterity to manage complicated text. So some of it um, you can see on the page, but often there are producers who have ideas or directors who have ideas that they want, to, want you to take it a step further. Um, and that was certainly one of them. Um, uh, Robert Town had a very clear idea of how he wanted me to try to mimic Steve Prefontaine. And um, I, I had the same instinct, which is that I wanted to be that guy. You know, I didn't, and I don't usually feel that way. I'm not, um, uh, what's the word like? It's not a, a predetermined, that's not a predetermined response for me when it comes to acting, that I want to be the character. I usually just want to perform the story and convince people that I'm the character. But that's different than like being the character and living as the character. But Robert um, it was really supportive of the idea that, um, that this is a real person and this is an opportunity for us to uh, create the illusion that he's alive again for the moment, you know, there, that, that kind of incentive. So I got to train with Olympic athletes uh, and study films of him running and then we would film me running and then I would, you know, calibrate over a series of weeks and months and um, then he was able to cut it together in a way that, you know, 
exploits the best of those. I mean, there, you could take, I'm, I'm sure, a certain number of those takes, and I wouldn't look like Steve Prefontaine at all. Uh, I mean, the running, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, not as though uh, the, the rendering on screen is an accurate representation of the attempt. The, it is the best version of what I did each time. Um, and, you know, if you asked me to do that performance, it wouldn't look anything like that. It's the same as, like, singing sometimes you hear singing um or i sing in something and i'm like that's not what it sounds like when i sing it that's what it sounds like when somebody pieces together um like all the notes that i got right over a three-hour session <laughs> in a 15 second song you know like there and then they auto-tune that um on top of it um uh, so that's what it's like film work. Film work is like for me too. You know, you, you, you have to begin to understand. Um, and you, of course you want to give them as many opportunities to use as much as possible. But I think my, I recognize my own limitations that, you know, I fail just as much as uh, um, I don't. And so again, like learning to turn the page after you give a really shitter, shitty rendering and take or whatever it is or blow the one moment. I, the guy who was directing that, um, Conrad Hall, is a legendary cinematographer. And he was trying to invent the what is now um, uh, a, a very common thing on any set, which is um, the laser um, giving the uh, number of feet or meters uh, so that the focus puller knows exactly where they are. Um, and before that, it was all tape and markers. And I mean, they still obviously use that a lot, but almost on every show that I work on now, you see somebody just double check with the laser. Well, Connie was pioneering that at the time, and he was trying to do it um, under pretty extraordinary circumstances, which is he only wanted to shoot the running scenes at magic hour, which means he had about a 45 minute window every day um, and he loved long shots. So the depth of field in a long shot at magic hour is about like that, which means if I go anywhere forward or out of that, I'm gonna be soft and that Connie's not gonna accept that. So I have to be really rigid about how I, and there would be some times when, and they were all me running, like right towards the camera. So the focus puller is watching the laser. Then the laser is breaking down because he's trying this new technology. And then I'm getting pissed off that I'm having to run again and running it. And then, um, and then finally you get one second that is, you know, like him come, like his head cresting over a hill at magic hour, really far away, super sharp and slow-mo. And, uh, and that, because that's in the movie, it, that seems to be like what we did all the time. No, that's the one time we got it right. You know, all of the effort that you put into it um, hopefully goes by goes by the wayside. But um, uh, I can't remember. At the end. <laughs> And then one of the things that you started doing in the late 90s was actually voiceover work for MasterCard, <laughs> which you did for several years. And I was really interested in whether that was something that you were actively seeking out that sort of work as a means of paying the bills and also the freedom that that then gave your career creatively to kind of go off and take projects that you really wanted to take rather than having to take projects for a paycheck. It was, uh, I mean, one of the things that we were taught in school is to kind of take the shotgun approach, you know, as I was saying before, find where you're... Um, where you're succeeding. And so I auditioned for commercials and voiceovers all the time. And I took that job um, because the woman who was running McCann Erickson at the time had hired me to do a demo for Champion Athletic Wear, and I got a $200 session fee. And um, so she wanted to do another demo for MasterCard, and I was going to get a $300 session fee. And I was like, yeah, of course. Um, so I went and did that. And then when McCann actually won the account, the people at MasterCard said, well, just use whatever voice you used in the demo track. And she called me and she was like, so um, you've got a job on the new price list campaign. And I was like, OK, cool. Um, and uh, I can remember about two years into it. Um, and, it, you know, it's still it, it, it was it was consistent money, but it was unpredictable uh, in so far as. I didn't know if it was going to be a six-month job or a year-long job or how many sessions they would need, but it started to take off pretty quickly. Um, 
And so they wanted to do more and more. And so it was taking more and more time. And uh, consequently, like I can remember I was shooting um, the high low country out in um, Santa Fe and um, McCann called and said, we need to record a voiceover. And so on your and we were shooting six day weeks um, and I was in every scene. So I was really, you know, exhausted doing it. And on my one day off, I had to drive to Albuquerque to do, you know, like you walk in and you're like, uh, poncho, four dollars. Rain gear, seven fifty. <laughs> Staying dry, priceless. Okay, are we good? All right, I'm gonna drive back to Santa Fe now. And you know, like I was getting irritated about it. Um, and then, like maybe a year after that, I discovered, wait a second, this is steady income. This nobody gets this. This is amazing. And so at that point, I started to really value the virtue of having steady income. And uh, so I started taking all the jobs that I wanted to take. Um, independent movies, plays. Um, when I did uh, Coast of Utopia, <laughs> when I did Coast of Utopia, it, it's a great way for me to bring up that I won a Tony Award. Um, but when I did, oh, thank you. I, did, I, was, I wasn't gonna say. But when, when um, Amer American Express was sponsoring the Tonys, and I wanted to say, I, th I thank American Express for the Tony and MasterCard for my career. Um, b because they, they really were responsible for me giving, being able to have the agency to take the kinds of parts um, that you, you, I wasn't getting you know, paid a lot of money for, like Jesus' Son and um, Waking the Dead, and um, then all the stuff that I would do on stage. Um, the, uh, it, it was, you don't take those parts if you're worried where the next paycheck is going to come, if you've got other opportunities. And the, the truth is I, w I had other opportunities at the time, but it wasn't stuff that I wanted to work on. It wasn't stuff that I thought I would grow in as an actor and um, that, or, I mean, I, I would say like my aesthetic started to kind of turn towards... I just want to be in something that has the opportunity to be rad. Whatever it is, like if there's just some little thing in it, whether it's the actor in it, the director in it, the, where, where the uh, play is taking place, or just if it has that opportunity, um, which leaves open the possibility of a lot of failure. And um, you can't do that if, you're not, if you don't have an income. You know? um, and so it, I was really blessed to, to have that and to have it going for... Um, as long as I did. And um, fortunately, uh, a, a very close friend of mine, Josh Hamilton, took over the, uh, the reins after, uh, after they let me go, um, after 13 years. Um, and um, it, when he called me, it was like, I, I thought he was like dating one of my exes. He had <laughs> the, the sound and he's like, hey man, I just, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know. Oof, this is hard. I don't know how to talk to you about this. I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, well, MasterCard called, and they want me. I'm like, you got the job. That's amazing. I was thrilled for him, you know. But he was really kind of sheepish because he knew how important it had been to my entire career and like making all those choices. But nobody gets that kind of um, uh, luck, and I did. So I'm incredibly grateful for it. And one of the great choices that you made along the way was your role in Almost Famous, which has become one of your most iconic roles out of your career. And you had actually never even played the guitar before. <coughs> so I'm really interested in, during that five, six week rehearsal process that you had, what some of the really useful aspects of figuring out just how your movement was gonna be on stage as a musician, and then also aspects of your character emotionally that you figured out during that time period. Um, well, it was, uh, you know, I think we all think when we go in for a part, I'll figure it out, okay? Give me the part first and I'll figure it out. I don't have to actually play guitar. I know you guys do stuff with the sound and you can do stuff with the camera and we can make it look like it. Just give me the part. Well, once I got the part, then I was like, oh crap, like he's supposed to be really good. That's, an, that's another level. It's not just playing guitar. He's supposed to be virtuosic. And so then Cameron and I talked a lot about how we were gonna sell that. Again, it goes back to the storytelling. Um, 
I don't need to be that guy. We just need to be it for the audience. And if they can be uh, emotionally involved with the story and not taken out of it by your inability to do something, then you've won. And so we kind of settled on this idea that if we just had one shot where I was playing a solo and they panned from my hands up to my face, that that would be enough. And so I drilled this one solo for three months, you know, until we finally, it was time to shoot it. And it probably took me a whole bunch of takes. Um, but that ended up being the thing that we kind of rested on. In terms of moving as um, uh, a guitarist, I, as soon as we got to band, we, we had like a band camp. It's fucking awesome. I mean, we had Peter Frampton and Nancy Wilson teaching us how to be. <laughs> It's like, you know, you get to go, I get to hang out with Olympic uh, athletes and uh, actual rock stars doing it. It is an incredibly privileged um, profession, uh, as certainly at times. Uh, and for me, I've been, uh, yeah, that, that was crazy. Um, but so uh, the rest of the uh, band members um, and I, we would show up for band practice and I was kind of stuck in my own body. I kind I wanted to play him like Dwayne Allman, like somebody who was like sitting in the background in the shadows just ripping these crazy solos, um, but not the front man, you know, um, like his brother who's out there selling to the crowd. Because one of Russ one of Russell's primary features was a reluctance uh to uh, be a part of the system and to buy into the fact that Stillwater was a great band and that the audience is a testament to Stillwater. He knew it was all a fad. He knew it was all selling by the music companies, um, but he still had a deep investment in his uh, music. So I, I would kind of sit there, band, band practice, try to like hang out next to the drum kit and like do my solos. All the music, by the way, is, was already made and pre-recorded. And the guy... Um, who was playing the lead guitar, was the lead guitarist for Pearl Jam. Um, so there's some pretty sweet licks coming off there. And I was trying to learn those, but again, staying in the back, probably a little bit self-conscious too. And Nancy and Cameron and, um, and uh, Peter said, we, we need a little more, you know, uh, enthusiasm over there from Russell. And I didn't know how to incorporate it until Cameron showed me a video of um, Bruce Springsteen in 1974, um, at like uh, probably at CBGB's or something, um, going ape shit on stage, and in a way that was like, he, like he had been possessed at a spiritual revival. And if you've ever seen one of his conf concerts, you know that's kind of what happens to him. Like he gets he gets possessed, um, and. He's still his most authentic self. He's still doing his rock and roll or whatever, but he is physically possessed by the spirit of the music. And that, that was to me like a crucial um, uh, um, a turning point where it kind of freed up my ability to that, that Russell could be both um, uh, distressed at the state of the commercial music industry and uh, relishing the opportunity to perform his music in front of people. Um, yeah. One of the choices I think that you made within that that was quite interesting is the fact that you actually didn't want people to know that you'd never played the guitar. Right. You didn't want that to be out in press so that people <laughs> would really 100% be looking at you as your character instead of, oh, look, he learned to do this, isn't that great? Why was that such an important choice to, for you and how did you come up with that concept? It was a total mistake on my part looking back on it. I should have t told people how good of an actor I was to pretend like that because I was trying to... to and make it seem, I, I wanted people invested in the story. Um, and th the best thing that you can do when you're playing somebody as opaque as him is um, not get in the way of the information that the viewer is going to get. I, I didn't want them to know much about me. I didn't want them to know anything about me. And um, if they had to believe that I could play guitar so that I could play this character, I wanted them to think I was Russell. Um, and because I, I wasn't terribly successful before that or wasn't a known name or whatever, um, 
that's certainly the reaction that I got was, well, I mean, it wasn't that good of an actor. It was just you, that character was that character, you know? Um, and uh, that was part of the idea behind it, which was just let people be invested in the story. Um, yeah. It definitely works. And then one of the films that you did following was Charlotte Gray, where you were starring alongside Kate Blanchett. And I was reading an interesting piece where she was talking about how you're someone who very much kind of stays a little quieter on set, keeps themselves to themselves a little bit more, and then you come and fully embody the performance. Is that always the approach that you had, or was that something that you kind of found for yourself along the way through your career? Well, for me, it's always been there. But for me, it's more a question of focusing. Uh, I, I, if I've done the proper amount of work, um, most of the stuff that I am interested in on film or in plays and stuff is typic typically complicated. And the characters um, maybe don't understand their own motivations. Maybe they're um, confused by their own uh, sense of self or their own feelings. Uh, all those complications uh, are fascinating to me. And I like to work out all the possibilities before that and understand textually where they could be rendered. And um, so I, I don't have a big enough brain to be able to manage all of the social um, uh, inform informality or that goes along with like, I'm so excited to be on the carnival with all you guys, you know, and get to perform our show. That, that to me, I love, but I can't do it before we do uh, the take, you know, or I can't do it. I can do it at the end of the show, but before the show, it's just, I mean, most pictures of me that I've seen before, um, like in rehearsal or um, before a take, I'm like this. Because I'm tr just yeah. trying to remember everything that I have to do so that I can be present enough uh, during the playing of the scene to have some kind of immediacy. So that's why I'm so quiet, not, not because I'm like um, getting into character. I'm like trying to remember what story we're trying to do, and I, I want to make sure to attend to all of the work that we've done collectively. Yeah. And kind of going off the back of what you were, were saying about like liking to ask a lot of questions and, and really kind of break down the scenes, when you did World Traveler, as an example, with Julianne Moore, that her style is a little bit more intuitive. And how did you work together to kind of merge these very different working styles? Oh, just hated each other. <laughs> um, we're actually very close. Her, her um, husband, Bart, is one of my close friends, and I adore Julie, and I actually love working with her. And we, but we work in completely opposite directions uh, or ways. Like, as soon as I enter the space for a scene that we're going to play. She's like, Billy, if you ask a single question, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> she, she is not interested in like all of the rehearsal and discussion that I like to get into. And I'm like, but how are we going to navigate this moment? This is such a complicated, let's talk about all the possible nuances. She's just like, la, 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 la. And Bart, who's my best friend and her husband, is like right in the middle of it. Um, so we had to find, you know, um, the sweet spot for us. And we've certainly been able to find it uh, in no small measure because, uh, you know, um, a mutual uh, uh, affection for one another. Um, uh, and, and in the movie After the Wedding, we worked together again because World Traveler and then Trust the Man After the Wedding, this was our third time working together. We've got the hang of it now. Um, I just know that she doesn't want to hear me speak and if I really want to goad her, I talk a lot about acting. And... Uh, <laughs> which I do a lot anyway. Um, and, uh, and she knows to let me talk a little bit, I'll get it off my chest, and then we can go ahead and play the scene. Yeah. I'd love to then move on to talking about when you did the play The Elephant Man, because it's such an iconic role, which must be challenging to approach when people have connotations of how that character is going to be. But what I thought was really interesting in reading about your rehearsal process is that you were coming at the character one way, and then partway through the rehearsal process, you actually realized oh, we yeah. need to strip this down. We need to play this very different we're not going to do any prosthetics it's all going to be a very physical embodiment so how did you kind of set about realizing that and then what were some of the interesting challenges and creative moments that came out of completely turning what you've done on its head in that way well um I hadn't thought about that in a while and I, the play itself if you look uh I think in the stage directions it says he appears without prosthetics so it was not in my mind uh, to ever uh, try it with prosthetics uh, that I can recall. And certainly not Sean Mathias's mind. Um, Sean is a theater animal. He likes the, the uh, potential of um, uh, 
magically transporting the audience with just theater craft, you know. Um, and uh, what had happened was I was I I, I was using a, a, um, a physical life that we sort of developed over the first three weeks of rehearsal. We probably had a five week rehearsal process or something. Um, that Sean <laughs> Sean just sat me down um, after three weeks with only two weeks before our first preview and said, "It's not working." Um, so tomorrow, abandon it and just move normally until we find something that does work. And I was like, great. You know, like, no, I, I, I didn't have the sense of like, oh, fuck. I had the sense of like, all right, this is weird. And maybe this will be really hard, but it sounds like we're going to try something novel and inventive. And... Over the course of that two weeks, we found a couple of touchstones um, physically that made sense to both of us. So that to me is, is, is significant in so far as it's a perfect example of how I'm aware that I'm the best actor I can be when I'm in a fully collaborative state. I need everybody's help. I know I, I'm not one of those people in drama school who like, couldn't wait for the time when we got our own space so I could do that one person show that I've been thinking about my entire life. Billy, you know, like <laughs> that I've been dreaming about since fourth grade, you know, and, and there's a lot of people who do. <laughs> By the way, it's a great idea if anybody's writing out there. <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it reminds me, my son got me a yoga mat one time. He wanted us to do yoga together, and it was just supposed to say Billy on it, but somehow it hit, somehow in the um, email that he sent to them, there was an exclamation point at the end of it. So my yoga mat says Billy, which is a terrible way to enter a meditation. Um, so you wake up very ready every morning. <laughs> But so I was never one of those people. I, I, I like I'm better, so much better, like by a f huge factor um, when people are shaping and directing me and um, um, and I'm feeding off what the other actors are doing when I can hear how the audience is responding to character choices. Um, that slow accumulation of knowledge is the thing that gives me the best potential to be effective in any given story. And that was a perfect example where I just had to put my full faith in Sean, that he had enough faith in me that he could say, let's get rid of the physical work we've done, start anew. Um, and it ended up being such an incredibly rewarding uh, process and uh, one that I'm, you know, so overwhelm overwhelmingly grateful for to this day to have had. Um, it was um, it, it, difficult in ways that I couldn't have imagined, which forces a kind of growth. You know, the, if you don't want your body to break down while you're doing something that extravagant, then you have to find new tools to strengthen or become more flexible. And um, so that was happening in real time during that. And um, it was, that's such a gift to get, you know, I mean, all of my friends are actors. I know the um, opportunities that most actors get. And working is like beyond the pale. I mean, to be able to make a living as an actor is incredible. To have one good part as an actor is phenomenal. And I've had a series of really incredible um, parts uh, which uh, is not lost on me. So I try to take advantage of those opportunities when I get them and, and, and use them to stretch myself and grow and stuff like that. One of the directors that I'm genuinely very intrigued as to how he works and how he directed you is Robert De Niro in The Good Shepherd because he's notoriously such an internalized person. So I'm curious kind of how he would navigate helping you find something in a scene. <laughs> I mean, this is one of my heroes, you know, like um, he was one of the producers on Stage Beauty, which was... Um, uh, another just incredible role that I that, that I got, um, and it was after that that he asked me to do um, um, the Good Shepherd. And his first note to me, cause I think the stage direction was the for the character was, um, you know, it's something like he comes in with uh, outrageous charm, or he comes in with a 
uh, um, a big en- big entrance. And um, so I did. And um, after <laughs> and after the take, um, he just like very quickly finds him. All of a sudden, he's there, and he's like, "A lot less." And so it was then like, <laughs> it was two months of him going, good, 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 but good. And on a totally different end of the spectrum, when you were doing Eat, Pray, Love with Ryan Murphy, um, I believe that he was encouraging you a lot to make choices yourself about your character. He wasn't necessarily yeah. always giving you the answers. So how did that kind of cause you to think about the way that you were playing that character differently to other roles you'd done before? It was so fun. Uh, nobody ever asked me to improvise before. and I had a whole um, day with uh, Julia Roberts and um, Ryan improvising. And that is not like my skill set. Uh, you know, I'm like text-based. If something is not written down, I won't understand that something else could be in there. You know, I've got friends who are like, you know, the movie's really great, but I just need to uh, rewrite the second act. And I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, it's written already. How are you going to invent something? You know, that is just not in my wheelhouse at all. And so to get to experience, um, because on the page, there, w- there was something that I think everybody wanted that they didn't know exactly how to articulate. And so once they had cast somebody, me, in it, they wanted to see how I could illuminate some parts of it. And um, so that triggered a whole new uh, engine, which was really fun to uh, experience. And we came up with um, some pretty kooky, fun stuff that he ended up keeping in there, which was uh, um, a real... You know what it did was it, it gave me the confidence that if something's not working, um, it, uh, there are other options beyond retiring. That because um, that's often how I, <laughs> that's often how I feel in a scene when it's not working. Well, I can just retire now. I've right had now. yeah, it's, it's been a good run, a uh, lot better than I thought it would be. Thinking of general college, um, so let's just leave it here. Um, that, uh, that, that I, if I start to get, uh, my mind working in terms of character and story and I always boil it down now, um, to what is the event? Um, and so that can happen. uh, What is the event in a, a single moment? What is the event in the scene? But more importantly, why have we invited people together to watch us tonight? For in a movie or in a play, what is the cathartic event that they're going to pay $60, $13, $300 for? And can you deliver a $300 cathartic event? Um, And so once you can get on board with the whole team about what you're trying to do there, then learning how to improvise around that starts to be a little bit easier. You start to be able to kind of clean up the things that aren't leading towards your collective goal. And um, I think um, uh, discovering how to uh, think about that has helped me in, in writing and, st- and certainly helped on the morning show with Carrie and stuff when, when she would be like, I, I'm not sure, what, is, what does Corey do there? And I was like, I'm not sure what Corey does there. How about we, you know, we each come up with five options and, you know, pick one of them. Um, and by and large, the, you know, everything up there is just her, me interpreting her writing. Um, but there are times, because he's such an opaque figure, that we both run into a novel situation. Like, how does he express affection? Like, uh, does that ever happen in his life? And how do we write to that, you know? Uh, and then we, if I hadn't had those early experiences, like that one with Ryan, I probably w- wouldn't feel as uh, open to um, uh, adding to that conversation. And then you've also had the pleasure of being directed by certain people who are also actors themselves, such as William H. Macy when he directed you in Rudderless. Is there something about the language and the communication that he brings to directing you in a scene that's, that's different to someone that hasn't been on the other side of the camera? Well, certainly the uh, affection and patience, you know, um, uh, th- that other actors have. Um, one, of, one of the things you're hamstrung, though, by as an actor is if, if you're in the middle of your career, you're also in the middle of your process. You know 
what your process is. So when somebody has a different one, it might be more difficult to uh, communicate. It, it wasn't the case with Bill in that way, but directors I have found in, in general, they know how to um, exploit the best potential of everybody. So whether it's the costume designer, the key grip, or the actors, they know everybody is in their own movie themselves, and they just need to get that one part out of them themselves that they can use. In the, and um, I remember Bill, because we do work in, in different ways, um, he said um, there, there was one moment where... Um, my character has to visit the grave of his, uh, not the grave, the memorial um, at the school. Um, and uh, he experiences the, the, the full weight uh, and loss of his son in a single moment. Something that he's been putting off through the uh, entire story. And um, so how that manifests itself in him... Um, we weren't exactly sure, um, but I had an idea that it struck a chord that he should be um, immobilized and um, changed from that. And um, I, I, it, sometimes it's just a practical thing. I, I, I had to go to Cannes because um, uh, a movie I did called Blood Ties that Guillaume Canet directed was at Cannes. And I called Guillaume and said, I can't come to Cannes, man. I'm in the middle of shooting this independent film in Oklahoma, and it's really fucking hard, and I can't, like, just fly to France. And he's like, well, we're going to buy a day. And so they bought a day of the shooting so that I could fly to Cannes and, of course, this is a low-budget movie, so the producers were like, yes, you're going to Cannes. <laughs> we're all very excited about you going to Cannes. You're definitely going to Cannes. Cannes is great. I love France. This time of year, it's the best. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to go to fucking Cannes. I'm in the middle of, like, this guy's head, you know. But so anyway, I flew to Cannes, and I flew back, and it was the day that I got back that I had to shoot this scene. And so there are practical parts. My body was, you know, tired. I was pissed off about Cannes and everybody loving Cannes and how much money this production made by me going to Cannes. Um, and so <laughs> we, we have a, a limited number of takes. Um, and the shot, it, it was a steady cam shot that he followed me from the car, essentially, in, in probably like a 30, 40 second walk up to the memorial. And then it, he just sort of stayed on me, waiting for whatever event was going to happen. And first take, we do the walk. I get to the memorial. I'm looking at it. <sighs> nope. Nope. Got nothing. Let's go back to one. Okay. Go back to one. Second take. <sighs> nah. No. I'm just angry about can. So <laughs> let's go back to three again. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, I've done a lot of work. There's a tremendous amount of preparation that I have, but I didn't want, uh, I wanted there to be, you know, we have this opportunity in some circumstances where we get to go beyond our own imagination of what we can do if we're moved in certain ways. And um, I wanted uh, to exploit the, the, this opportunity. It was there narratively for that. And so I didn't have a specific design in terms of crying or yelling or beating something up or um, collapsing. I just wanted to be involved with the event and see how it it moved through me. And um, after like four or five takes of this, Bill was like, okay, I'm fucking done with your process. Um, and I was like over by the tree, again, like this, as I normally am, <laughs> going through my notes, yeah. listening to, uh, you know, think, uh, tr musical tracks that I had made to kind of lead me in a direction. And um, he just goes, hey, hey quick, um, so um, f fake it. And I was just like, <sighs> and so that, you know, that led me back to the workmanlike approach, uh, which is that sometimes we don't get to exploit the best of um, what we might create out of nowhere. Sometimes we just have to go to work. And so I had to, you know, like fake my rendering of something that would happen, which 
obviously led to something else, um, which I, I hadn't anticipated. But um, for him, it was like a no brainer um, that that's a, a reasonable request to ask at a certain point. And for sure, um, I should have just reminded him of Can in that moment. But <laughs> like, I just came from Can. I can't fake it because of Can. <laughs> In a different spectrum of film to something like Rudderless, I would love to talk a little bit about films like Alien Covenant and Watchmen, because when you think about them on paper, they sound like very similar styles of performance and acting. They're both very CGI heavy, very special effects heavy, but yet they also sound really different with the details. So Zack Snyder, it's like you're doing motion capture, the character that we're seeing on screen, your face isn't actually on screen ultimately. Um, you're kind of like attached to all these contraptions as you're running around, so there's a physicality to that, versus someone like Ridley Scott who like to have a lot of in-camera effects and would have people dress up in costumes and chase you around the set. And so how you kind of thought about those two different films in similar but also very different ways in terms of your performance. No, you're spot on. Uh, there, uh, uh, Also, too, I, I adore both of them. They were, um, they gave me wonderful opportunities and they were in, in, uh, incredibly gracious yeah. and, uh, and creatively as open and ingenious day after day as anybody I've worked with. And both of those were long shoots. And, um, you know, Ridley's been doing this for a long time and he is just, he's a first rate badass on set. Um, and um, Zach too, his kind of enthusiasm for storytelling and the potential of Watchmen at the time and, um, it was uh, it, it, it was great to watch him be around. Um, the totally different processes. Um, <coughs> Watchmen was really difficult, um, mostly because I looked so ridiculous in the actual motion, because I wasn't just wearing a motion capture outfit. Zach had this idea that... Um, uh, Dr. Manhattan glows so that they would dress me up in a suit that had 2,000 LEDs on it that were blue so that when I moved, I was essentially like a, um, a lighting instrument. When I moved, you would see the blue move across somebody else's face. Well, the practical effect was that I was in like a, a unitard, a white unitard with batteries hanging down uh, from my uh, hips that were making the ass of the unitard sag like you know i crap my pants and i'm standing on like boxes uh to be tall enough for it with dots all over my face by the way a guinness book world record number of dots at the time i was actually in the guinness book thanks for asking between that and the tony awards i'm getting all my plugs in which was uh, the greater pleasure <laughs> uh, the guinness book of world records because I, I used to buy the guinness book every year when i was younger um but so the um i looked so ridiculous um that the other actors were laughing at me and i had to have a discussion <laughs> with them and and say like so zach one of the reasons we know the king is the king is because of the way that everybody else acts around them. The king doesn't have to do anything. It's that everybody else who is subservient makes him the king. Well, I'm the king, okay? I've got all the power. Nobody here has any power. They can't keep laughing at me. It's, just, it's like I'm humiliated. And I would have talks with Jeffrey and, um, and Malin. And I couldn't see Jackie uh, laughing because he had a mask on. But Patrick Wilson and, you know, like everybody they were in hysterics um so i had to like subjugate my own ego um to try to find so it was a great creative leap um to have to make uh every day and to have confidence in him um and it turns out that the actual cgi it it really is me um and it, because it was a laser scan of my face and the number of dots correlated to every muscle that would move. And when they could do it down to the, um, the pore, the laser scan down to the pore, I essentially had an exact replica of myself, albeit on somebody else's body. Um, but uh, it was this like six foot four bodybuilder. Um, but I manipulated his body and it was really my face. So it was, it was, incredibly strange to see in the end because um, 
it was not my experience of working at all. So it, it was a, a, a great imaginative leap. And to your point, you're exactly right. Ridley does the opposite. You've got everything there. I mean, you've got the alien ship. We shot it in New Zealand in a place that, you know, the South Island of New Zealand, New Zealand, it really, it, it looks like another uh, habitat entirely. I mean, it, it, it is. There's a bird there that because there's no predators, that um, it, it, it never had to develop a long-term memory. It just has a short-term memory and it walks around, it can't fly. And so if you walk up to it, it'll get spooked. Um, but if you freeze, it'll forget you're there and start walking again. And then if you move again, it'll get spooked. So, so you can f fuck with them endlessly. It's really, it's worth going to New Zealand just for that. Uh, great bird. Um, and also probably a good character to play too. Um, but uh, but Ridley, Ridley sets everything up for you. Um, I mean, we, there's this one scene when they arrive at, um, what has been the the epicenter of the this destroyed civilization and you're walking through these like it's Pompeii you know um these ashen figures um that shit was built I mean they had a lot in Sydney that was this entire thing and uh, it was magnificent to behold so you didn't need to do a whole lot of imagination um to prepare yourself for what that experience would be like. Yeah. So, and I mean, the interior of the ship was the interior of some ship. That's what it felt like. I mean, it was every single facet of it. And Ridley was giddy about it. I mean, he would walk around and be like, ah. yeah, yeah, we built that. <laughs> Took 16 months. <laughs> Dig in. <laughs> now, nah, fuck with it. You can fuck with it. <laughs> you know, he was great. I mean, it was. It was really extraordinary. Um, but yeah, they were two wildly different experiences. Uh, you know, to, to, none of it, is, whether it's a big sci-fi movie or you know, a, a movie about like the drama of banality, they're all huge leaps of the imagination. None of them are me. So I don't, there's not a big distinction to me in terms of the creative part, part of it. It's, it, it all might as well be on an alien world. None of the things that I do have any proximity to my real life, um, except for Billy. Um, <laughs> coming soon. Coming soon. <laughs> um, so uh, I, it, it all is similar in that way. Yeah. I'd love to dive into talking about your work in TV for a little bit, because Gypsy was kind of the first drama TV series that you've done, and it it was working with multiple directors as opposed to one film director, but also I imagine you have to think about your character's arc very differently. So I was curious about that and then also how that came into play when you started working on The Morning Show recently. Well, it, uh, um, yeah, it was really hard actually. Uh, and one of the reasons that I had, hadn't explored TV much to that point is because I didn't know how to embark upon a character where I hadn't read the script. And, uh, the idea that there was going to be a 10-hour ten, ten narrative and they were going to only show me one of the hours and that I'm somehow supposed to calibrate all of it, it does not work into my way of thinking. Um, I, I, I have to think of the long-term arc of where I'm starting so I can, you know, um, build, build, a, build a foundation. Um, because uh, if the story tar starts taking twists and turns, I will have made a choice early on that's really going to screw up something later. Um, and uh, so with Gypsy, I had an idea of the arc um, of it, but it, it really took some getting used to in terms of the directors because I'm used to um, collaborating, like I was saying before. That is a, a, a primary... Um, feature of what I think, uh, when I think I can be the, my best version um, uh, of myself as an actor is by getting the advice of the people who are around me. Um, and there is uh, um, a completely different contextual relationship on a TV show where the directors have the sense, I think often, that the actors don't want to talk to them because they know their characters already. And so uh, oftentimes won't uh, endeavor to uh, have a conversation. Um, uh, and you have a disproportionate amount of power. Like, I, I'm not telling the story. 
I'm just a part of the story. I don't want to have governorship over all of it. That's why I'm in this job. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I found it uh, a great learning experience in that way. Um, but I ended up relying more on the producers and the writers uh, in terms of calibrating the overall arc of it. And then um, the process of getting um, scripts on a weekly or bi-weekly basis or however um, we got them, you, you just accommodate and do the best you can. And for me, I feel like the work, um, it, it, it was harder for me to be specific. It, the the um, demands of that role in particular were not so sophisticated um, because it was mostly circumstance. Um, it wasn't really behavioral character study. Um, and so w once I, I had a foundation for who that character was in his life, if they threw different circumstances at you, it was okay to um, figure it out. Um, but with the morning show, um, that character speaks in paragraphs and he thinks in paragraphs. And that to me is just straight up work. And I told Carrie early on, I said, because I, I, I had to go out and win the job. They didn't really want me for that part. So I had to go out and tell them why I would, like why Corey should be mine. And um, w one of the uh, things I told her is I, I can't talk like Corey and I can't think like Corey, but I can work hard enough and I have enough skills that I'll make it seem like I'm Corey after a while. And, and that'll be plenty, I promise, that'll be great. Um, and he had lots of interesting language, um, but it, it's a question of me doing the text work and then literally getting my mouth to be able to move at that speed with that language. And um, if I don't get it, a, 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 when they would like give us, I don't know, taupe pages, you know, which is like at the end of the, you've already gotten the blue pages and the red pages and the, like there's been 40 different pages of them trying to find the right thing. You get, you know, the taupe page and you're like, oh shit, this is the day before. And you've got like a new monologue. Man, that, that was, yeah, that was complicated. Um, so I asked her during, once she gave me the job, I said, because I can't think like him or I, or I don't talk like him and think, just give me two weeks. Like if you can give me two weeks every time, that's enough time for me to prepare whatever I need to do in any given episode. Because mercifully, it's a supporting part, so I wouldn't have you know so much to prepare. Um, and so she was actually really reliable about that, um, which is yeah rare in, in those uh, circumstances. And you know there were a couple of times where um, I got like a page and a half monologue the day before something. And I just had to like hold up the white flag and go, nope, sorry, <laughs> um, don't know how to do it. You, you wanna reduce it or do you wanna see me sweat through this? Uh, and so they would reduce it and find some version of it that I could accommodate. But um, if they gave me enough lead time, um, I could you know, put my nose to the grindstone. One of the things that I think is so interesting about the way that you play Corey and you portray him on screen is that he has very little backstory. He exists on screen entirely in the ecosystem of his job and his colleagues. We don't see the other side of his world. And there's that one little nugget of information that we get when he's in conversation with Bradley, where he's like, yep, my dad left and I have this ambition and I wanna screw everyone else over and take over the world. And that's kind of all we know about what's driving him. And yet you find all these facets to bring into your performance. So how did you think about the way that you wanted to develop that backstory for yourself and was that something that was important for you to do? Well, it, what was most important to me was where he sits in the story. Yeah. Um, uh, in order for uh, recent gen to be powerful in a way, they need um, a powerful rival. And so the way that he speaks, you, you could interpret as sort of buffoonish, the way that he behaves in some ways. Um, but the more buffoonish you make him, um, the less powerful they are. You want somebody who is equally um, as capable of managing these. We're talking about really high stakes. I mean, the people who do these morning shows, man, they live in a different world. Um, and it's like um, um, elite athletes. They just they are able to compartmentalize and function in circumstances that are really foreign to most people and, and, and incredibly difficult to navigate. And yeah, I mean, and she's compensated. I mean, um, 
Jen's character is compensated in an extravagant way, which then leads to more complicated things. Is what do you do when you have that much money? So they're dealing with all sorts of crazy kinds of things, and you need somebody who can meet them at that level. And so when I read the text, I thought of a very specific kind of person, one that I've met a million times over in New York, if you've ever been to a charity event. Um, <laughs> You have these uh, type A people who um, they don't have uh, the benefit of failure yet, so they're pretty sure about every idea they have, and they kind of shit sunshine wherever they go about it because they're more than willing to share every bit of it um, because they've thought it through. Very, And I, I feel like Corey actually has an um, expert capacity to mentally process social calculus. That's his, that's his strength. He can walk into a room of high-powered people and go, do, 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 you know, like, and something goes, and he's like, that's the person I need to zoom in on, and I know exactly what I need to tell them in order to get them on my side. Um, and as the president of the network, I just need to shape people and then let them do their things. Um, and I've seen that kind of person, I, I feel like, in a lot of different areas in New York. And uh, that, um, th was that the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. on a separate note, um, the the episode where you and Jennifer Aniston perform one of the songs from Sweeney Todd was oh God, yeah. so fantastically done. Nice. And I know that you guys pre-recorded it at Capitol, Radio, Capitol Records, um, but then you also were still kind of performing it on set. And I'm also curious if there were elements from doing other roles which had music performance elements, such as Almost Famous and Rudderless, even though they're very different, yeah. where the work that you'd done there kind of helped you in preparing for that specific scene in that episode. Oh yeah, no question about it. I mean, one of the great disappointments of graduate school is as phenomenal a teacher as Deb Lapidus was, she couldn't teach me to be a better singer. Um, I'm just not very good. Uh, you know, with it was, it, singing requires, you know, pitch and, phrasing and tone and all of those things are really elusive to me. Um, I don't like to be tied down to a single key. You see? <laughs> I'm more for like the John Cage atonal st scale. Um, the, the, the secret of that though is I never know when I'm gonna change keys and I often don't know that I have changed keys <laughs> except <laughs> except from the expression of the people around me. <laughs> but so in graduate school, there were some phenomenal singers uh, in, the, in, in there. And they were like, it, every time we had to sing, it was always like they'd give me a pat on the back for effort, pat, pat on the back for effort. Um, but it didn't give me the confidence to actually perform in any other way uh, other than like if I was playing a character who had a lot of enthusiasm for singing but couldn't sing. Like that I can do. Um, you get me into a karaoke room and I'd be like, nah, 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 and then I get that microphone and forget it. Nobody else is singing anything. Um, but uh, with these, uh, with Rudderless in particular, um, it like in, and the only time I had to sing in um, Almost Famous was the uh, Tiny Dancer scene, and everybody was laughing at me then, too. I mean, they ended up, you know, he, he used some, like, there's barely a little bit of uh, Billy singing in that, because um, everybody else could sing. Um, and I had to sing out, you know, like, really loud and stuff, and yeah, it was not good. But the, um, in Rudderless, um, we really wanted to record um, the songs and you know there again there was a narrative conceit that helped me which was the father was trying to process his son's loss the loss of his son and uh, he had an emotional attachment to trying to uh, render these songs and so therefore the quality of it wasn't as important as the commitment to it that being said um, Bill still wanted it to be on pitch, and um, so we recorded them as well, and um, and they, <laughs> I, I remember a moment, because I, I worked really hard, uh, um, after Almost Famous, I played gu guitar by myself, like, a, you know, just as like a self-soothing kind of thing, like, um, come home after a, a show, and you're all keyed up and you have to kind of get yourself to bed. So you play some chords or I put my son to sleep and play some chords from, you know, try to figure out one Neil Young song. Um, and um, 
which is not hard, but if you're terrible, it is hard. And so, but I did a lot of that. And so I kind of like got more familiar with uh, the guitar. And when that role came around, um, I had it dead set in my mind that I was going to be able to sing and play the guitar on like one of the tracks and it was going to be me. And after, rec <laughs> after recording all of them, um, it was clear that nobody in the creative team wanted it to be me. All that like my guitar is not the guitar they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear like a guitar that sounds like somebody who can play the guitar, not somebody who's trying to play the guitar. Um, but then on the actual day of recording this one song, um, I asked him if I could just do a take um, without the playback. Um, and oh my God, did I shit myself. It was so terrifying. Uh, and the feebleness of the guitar and the voice and everything else, like because it, you're so vulnerable in that moment. Bill like came up in the middle of the take and was like, are you good? Can we do the playback now? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I, I got that out of my system. You're right. None of us need to see that again. And um, so then you, kind of, you accommodate the experience and get to the storytelling part of it. But um, that being said, you know, I've, I've, I continue to play uh, those songs and sing, uh, but just to myself. <laughs> It's perfect. I wanted to jump into a couple of questions that we got from the audience. Um, the first one's actually asking about auditioning and you've previously talked to once in an interview about how uh, you would go into every audition as if it was the first take on a film set, assuming that you wouldn't get the job and how you kind of navigated landing on that for yourself. Yeah, well, the way I mean, the way I thought about it was um, that it was my opportunity to play the role. Yeah. Um, not that I was actually d playing the role uh, like uh, in in the movie or the play, but that that audition room in front of those people was it was my performance, and that's pretty awesome to get a chance to perform, you know. So like get into having an audience of two, who are super judgy. <laughs> they got they got pads with them. Um, that's your weird audience. And if you've, if you've played to a house in New York, you get those houses sometimes. I mean, this is a lot more crowded than a lot of um, shows that I've done, you know, like where we have to buy pizza the, for the second intermission to get them come back for the fourth act. Um, there, you, you have to be ready for that kind of uh, response. So if you can trick yourself into thinking that it's okay to have like, one judgy audience member or two and still feel excited about the opportunity to perform in front of them, you get ownership of some portion of your own control that eliminates a lot of the self-consciousness that, com that, that comes into wanting it so bad, the other thing. Because you actually have something. You have that one thing. It's, and then when it's over, then you move on. Like, and if they call you back and they say, okay, we want you to perform that again, but this time you're gonna do it on film, we're gonna pay you money, you go, great. I never thought that would happen. I already did the performance, you know? That it's a little mental trick that, um, it also made my curiosity about um, uh, working on auditions um, free, more free. Because I, I didn't feel constrained by what do they need to see? What do they want? How can I shape myself to get what they want? What do I put on, you know? like. I did, what, what, would they do, what would I do for my performance? And if it wasn't quite right, they would say, it's not quite right. Um, either come back another day or you're not right for the part. I mean, actually, my, my first audition for Arcadia, um, Daniel Swee, who's the casting director at Lincoln Center, um, he, he gave me a, a note in the middle of the audition, and um, it, it was about, like, Septimus, the, the character who's the tutor, being self-conscious about his own sense of humor, um, it, that he, he spends all his day with a 13-year-old. The only thing he can do to entertain himself is make jokes that she won't understand. Um, and so there's a kind of delight that comes with that, a kind of wry delight. And I, he said it in a way that was really articulate, but I couldn't do it on the day. I just couldn't fold it into what I had already worked on. And I didn't really discover it until I left the audition room. And then I was like, oh, fuck, I know what he means. I, I think if I got another shot, I, I, that would be awesome. So I immediately called my agent and I was pretty new and clearly my agent hears that a hundred times a day. And then I was like, oh, you feel like you could do it better, huh? I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, no, no, it's not that. It's uh, like he gave me a note that I, I really know how to apply. Um, and so he called Daniel and, and, and the response he got um, 
And as I'm saying this now, I wonder if he even did call Daniel. But um, he says he called Daniel, and the response that he got was, well, you're, you're, you're just not right for the role. And, but I was so excited that I understood the direction that I kept working on it with a friend of mine because it was also killer text. I mean, like at, at some point I was going to use Septimus as an audition or a monologue or something. And then they spent about three weeks um, where they couldn't, um, find somebody. And, and in that three three weeks, I actually got fired from another job. And I was kind of like in despair in New York about like, what am, do I really want to do this? And they called back and said, um, they couldn't find anybody for Septimus. Do you want to come back in? And man, I knew that shit back and forth by that point. And I came in and Daniel was like, well, that's a good adjustment. Um, <laughs> you want to see Trevor tomorrow? And I was like, yep, let's go. <laughs> And so I saw Trevor Nunn the next day and got the part that afternoon. Yeah. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to ask you as well about auditioning when you did Alien Covenant because you didn't get a meeting with Ridley Scott. You didn't even get an in-room audition. You actually had to tape yourself. Yeah, I didn't even get the script. I got dummy sides. Yeah, which I, I think like, is... I was like, man, I'm almost 50. Come on. I've done some movies before. Can I at least look at the script? Right. Which, to that point, is something that sometimes people decide that they don't want to self-tape self at that point. They don't want to audition. And so the way that you got the role was actually by being very open to still doing that. So why was it really important? And then what did you use those three days of prep that you had to figure out in terms of how you were going to tape it? Well, I mean, I, I would be lying if I said there wasn't a little bit of spite in that taping. Um, um, a little bit of, of like man, you're not going to even give me the real sides. All right, let me show you what to do with these sides. All right. And that one, I actually did rewrite a whole bunch of stuff. I'm like, that character's stupid. Let me do, I need to be more like this, man. He's like a cult leader. Like, you know, so I came up with this whole idea of um, somebody who, you know, as a fundamentalist, entrenched in their idea of the world and very confident about it, and um, and not silly at all, like super serious, uh, but but maybe dumb to the point where he's blinded to something so obvious as like going to the wrong planet. Um, but he, he, uh, um, he a, a conviction that didn't come across as pathological, that came across as uh, sensible, those are always the most dangerous people. The ones who sound very reasonable when they talk to you about their fundamentalist point of view. Because you get like, well, you're relating to me like a person, but you just said that gravity doesn't work or the earth is flat? What happened? You know, and all of a sudden, you, you know, the tables are turning. He's one of those guys. He can speak very um, comfortably and confidently because he, he's got entrenched in his own mind. And so I put that on tape with Carmen. Uh, Carmen Cuba was the casting director with that. And then um, and I was kind of like, so there, and walked out of the room. And then um, I immediately called Carmen and was like, listen, if that was terrible, please just bury it and let's move on. And she was like, no, I think it was interesting. I'm going to send it to Ridley. And, uh, and he was like, well, you're the only one who decided not to play him as a schmuck. Um, and that you wanted to, like, that he, there was an earnest attempt for him to make the best choice for his crew at every time, even though his thinking was so um, um, convoluted. Um, and I, I have to say that resilience has got to be one of the things that you build up as an actor if you want to do this for your life. I mean, there's not a single stage at the desire to perform that isn't rife with awful pitfalls. You don't get the audition. You get the audition, but you blow it. You get the audition, you don't blow it, but you don't get the part. You get the audition, you don't blow it, you get the part, then you blow it on the day. You get it on there. You don't blow it on the day, but then they don't use it. They don't use it, or then they use it, and the movie comes out, and nobody sees it. Or the movie comes out, and everybody sees it, and they tell you you're awful. Um, like, you're great in it, everybody sees it, and then nothing happens. You know, like, there, I mean, there's just every stage of it. You have to be ready. And then sometimes something for no predictable reason takes off. And for, like, 48 hours, your life feels like it changed. And then the 48 hours is over. And you have to go back to 
the resilience of like working on the working on the craft and going there with the dummy sides. Like Ridley Scott doesn't want to <laughs> meet with me. He didn't see Elephant Man or Billy. <laughs> You man, after your dummy size and the of stupid text. <laughs> I think that leads really great into this next question, which is about your work in theater and the resilience that you need to have then, because there's so many different nights that you can have, whether it's your performance or whether it's the energy of the audience <laughs> in the room, and you're doing so many shows per week on such a long run. So, how do you reconcile when you feel like maybe it wasn't the A performance that you were hoping for that night? Yeah, that ha that was the bane of my existence. I think for the first t 10 years I was acting was just always like, God, I know I have a better one in me. Like I know there is like the uh, Robert De Niro would call it like your bedroom version. Like I know you've got a better version, but what we have to live with is the version you did today. So I don't care that you've got that version in you. I mean, God bless you, but please bring it here if you're going to do it. Um, and that was heartbreaking to me that I couldn't always deliver my best version in every circumstance. And I think at a certain point, um, probably doing a long run, I, I probably coast of utopia, I bet is when I came, this was in 2009, uh, no, 2005. Uh, 2000, yeah. yeah, 2000. <laughs> um, we'll call it 2005. And, um, and I had this phenomenal monologue in it. And it's one that you don't ever want to blow because you know that like everything is teed up for you there. And all you have to do is deliver. And it was like an essential part of the first part of this play in speaking to some of the philosophical changes that how they're tied to class and how important it is for people to have art. Uh, um, and this guy Belinsky is explaining it to this um, room uh, full of the bourgeois, and he's like incensed about it. It's, a, it's just an incredible monologue. And sometimes I would blow it. And so you have to reconcile that um, you're never going to give your peak performance. And I think the thought that occurred to me was you have to think of it like baseball. You just, you're, what you're left with is your average, not your best day, not your worst day, but your career average. Can you come in and mostly? give a professional effort. Sometimes you'll sing in a way that you can't expect. That's why it's awesome and magical and like what a great thing to be able to do. Um, but sometimes you won't have anything in you and you still have to do the work and you won't have anything in you. And the audience will know that you don't have anything in you. They'll be like holding their nose at you and you still have to get through the day and come back the next day. And if you can keep your average at a place where you feel comfortable um, and that the marketplace feels comfortable, then you're doing well. Well, I want to thank you for sharing such amazing and very open insights on your craft and your process. It's been really incredible. I wish we had time to, to dive into even more of it. Thank you so much. And congratulations again on your SAG nomination. And thanks to all of you guys for coming. Thank out you tonight. guys. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Pleasure.